by a show of hands, how many of you at least believe that I hear from the Lord? Let me see your hand. Yes. Uh, that's several of you. Some of you don't know me. That's fine. That's cool. But let me tell you, I do hear from the Lord. And one of the things that I heard the Lord say to me, to say to you, was he told me to tell you, help is on the way. He says, help. He says, help. He says, help is on the way. Now, you can apply this to whatever and wherever you are in your life. Everyone say, help is on the way. Psalm 121, and I encourage you to open your Bibles as we will walk about a few of these verses. It goes without saying, brothers and sisters, that we are living in a time of great uncertainty. We're living in a time of a great uncertainty of fear because so many people are wondering, what does the future hold for me? Each and every year we get an opportunity to hear what God is saying to our churches overall. Many of you remember in the month of December God spoke to us and I communicated with you all. And I told you that the year of 2020 God said would be a year of manifested clarity. He said that this would be a year that things that was once foggy and out of sight he says the perspective of how we've seen things will be different. And of course, we are experiencing that. We are seeing that even now. If you all would have asked me a couple of months ago, I would have never predicted that the world would be caught up in what we are interpreting now as a deadly new strand of the coronavirus. We have had scares before. We have endured and we have come through a lot of things that in the very beginning it looked like it had destruction written all over it. Many of you are in this room and those of you all who are watching from around the world would remember we have survived hurricanes. We've survived floods and tornadoes. We've survived tsunamis. Many of us, we remember the Spanish flu. We remember the H1N1 virus. Many of us remember Ebola, um, anthrax, you know. So many things that will come about that was unfamiliar to us that brought about a lot of fear. All of these, interesting, were contained. And after some scare, unfortunately, even after some death. But here we are again. In this uncertain time, now we are counting the new cases. How many people will be infected? How many people will die. Many of us, we are, we've been battling all week long, even thoughts of the enemy. Because if you have a scratchy throat, or if you sneeze, or if you cough, oh, oh Lord, I must be, I, you know, you'll be surprised of how many people are living in torment, living in fear. You can hardly find a bottle of sanitizer in Orleans Paris. The question is, were you cleaning your hands before this? That's the <laughs> real issue. Even though every year, even though every year, the regular flu, influ influenza, the regular flu takes tens of thousands of lives in America. And even worldwide, the CDC reported that over 14,000 people last year lost their lives. They died from the flu. 
But we're not afraid of the flu because uh, it's not advertised as it has been advertised concerning the coronavirus. Every year, people lose their lives over just the flu. And somehow this COVID-19 has now become scarier because it is an unknown element. Because we don't fully understand it. And we don't yet have a vaccine against it. I want to talk to your hearts this morning. I want to minister to the inside you. When you feel unsettled, when you feel unsafe, when you feel that you are in need of personal help, Psalm 121 is a great reminder of our only and ultimate security. And I want to encourage each of you, certainly this week, in fact, you're going to have time. We ain't got a whole lot of places to go. So you're going to have time to read it. I want you to, <laughs> amen, amen. Kids, y'all ain't got school. Read Psalm 121. We, I, I want you to read this. And I, I want you to read it slowly. And I want, this is a great devotional reading because this is a psalm very much like Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is an antidote to pain and an antidote to trouble. Here it is now, Psalm 121 is a great reminder of our security. Three times a year, faithful Israelites' families would march from small towns of their nation to the proud city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as many of you know, was home of Solomon's temple. And it is very interesting because Deacon Knox, Jerusalem, the capital, sat on a hilltop. And so no matter what direction you came from, you could truly say that you were going up to Jerusalem. And because of where Jerusalem was situated, you would be able to see it from a distance. So it is recorded that even as these pilgrims would walk up toward Jerusalem, the Israelites, they would walk up toward Jerusalem and they would often sing together to help pass the time. The, the singing was something that they would do consistently to kind of help pass the time because you see, this was before cell phones and they couldn't Google and check their Facebook and they couldn't go on social media. Uh, so they would spend time singing. And what they were sing many times is they would sing the word of God. Psalm 121 is one of those what is called ancient psalms. Psalm 121 is one of the psalms that they will sing as they are going up to Jerusalem. Look with me y'all, look with me y'all if you would at the opening verses of Psalm 121. And if you've been saved for longer than a month, you've heard something about this before. <laughs> Listen to what he says in Psalm 121 and verse 1. I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. He says in verse 2, just in case if you didn't know, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Lots of things today, lots of things are promoted and a lot, lots of things are advertised today. And Cindy, these things that are advertised and promoted today are things that are supposed to bring us or give us help. Think about it. Whenever you're watching the television now, almost every other commercial is about some new drug, some new tablet uh, that it to help you do this. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry now is booming on television, on the internet. Take this pill, and if you take this pill, all of your pain will be gone. Take this pill, you'll forget you ever even had pain. 
Now they're saying, take this pill and it will cure your depression. Take this pill and it'll pump you up. It'll lift you up. So now we got pills to take us down, pills to take us up, pills to help us rest, pills to help us go to sleep, pills. Pill. And then on top of that, let's not forget the alcohol industry. People are now drinking more than they've ever drank before because society tells us that alcohol will numb your fears. Drugs at an all-time high. People today will take drugs to bring more validity to life. And if not that, then you're encouraged to get a hobby. Start a new hobby because a hobbies help to keep your mind busy. And if all of that fails, they'll say, well, you need some new friends. Get you some new friends because new friends will bring fulfillment. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know, ultimately, our help comes only from the Lord. The only true and living God who is the maker of both heaven and earth shared with our leaders this past week, you got to always understand and never ever forget that those who sell the panic are also the same ones that sells the pills. Most, most people don't want you to get better because if you get better, you affect their bottom line. But how many of you know God is a healer and God is a deliverer and he is our only help so Psalm 121 reminds us of three great ways that God helps us and I see it right there in the text and I want to share this with you and then we'll pray but these are three great ways that God helps us and I want you all to consider this how does God help us well number one God helps us because God watches over you always he watches over you always let me see by a show of hands how many of you know that God is watching over you he's watching over you always let me hear the church say always look with me if you would at verse 3 and verse 4 of Psalm 121 the word says he will not allow your foot to be moved he who keeps you will not slumber verse number 4 says behold he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. How many of you know again, how many of you know he's, you're covered? He, 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 watches, he watches over you. And this is what God utilize, uses the psalmist to remind us. Most of us, we know this, but we need to be reminded that he watches over us. Several of you are aware of it. Um, Sister D, much of my life, not much of it, but from May of 1986 to May of 1990, for those four years, I served on active duty in the United States Army. The, being in the Army took me literally around the world, but it exposed me to so many practices and so many behaviors that I must admit I've adopted into my life, although I'm out of the military active duty, I still yet practice them. One of the things, Deborah, I really remember that it still sticks close to my heart is the things that I remember and the things I experienced when I was there on active duty. A big no, a big mess up, a major ball dropped in the military is falling asleep on guard duty some veterans don't. one one thing that you never would want to do is to fall asleep on guard duty when it comes to the military's mortal sins falling asleep on guard duty is right up there with losing your weapon 
Now that's another thing. That's another thing. Oh God, if a if if a if a supervisor, if a sergeant, if someone saw a weapon that was unaccompanied, a weapon alone, when 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 it is found out who that weapon belongs to, you best believe that soldier is in big trouble. Because one thing you never would do is separate from your weapon and certainly not fall asleep on guard duty. Because when you're on guard duty, it is your job to watch the perimeter while everyone else in the camp is sleep and resting. And if you're asleep and the enemy shows up, now you have impaired the whole camp. You never would fall asleep on guard duty. It's a huge, it's a big deal because falling asleep on guard duty could be the difference between life and death. And maybe that's why Psalm 121 ministers to my heart so much because here we see that God never sleeps and he never slumbers. Why? Because he's on guard duty. And not only is he on guard duty, but he's watching over you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank God that he's watching over you. Come on. I mean, where would really, where would your life be today in light of some of the decisions you've made in the past if God wasn't watching over you? The Hebrew word watch over. Or the Hebrew word keep is the word that appears six times in this short poem. It is the same amount of times that we see the word Yahweh or the word, the name Jehovah. It is actually interpreted, we see it written as the Lord. But the Lord is Yahweh. The Lord is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Who is Jehovah? Jehovah is the God who keeps his promise. He's a God who keeps his promise. How many of you know if God say he's going to do it, he's going to do it. If God spoke it, it's going to come to pass. Because God is not like man. Man will lie and man will tell you what you want to hear. But God will tell you what you need to hear. God will always give you the truth. Every one of you take a deep breath and let it out. Let me tell you, God has your back he has your back no really he he has your back now i know right now you just don't thinking about coronavirus but i'm telling i'm talking about your life god has your back he watches over our lives and not only do he watch over our lives but he watch over our lives day in and day out sometimes you pray and you see nothing happening and you wonder if God is asleep at the wheel no he's not asleep just because he hasn't answered your prayer the way you thought was best doesn't mean he haven't answered it oh I gotta say that again Winnie listen to this. just because God hasn't answered your prayer the way you thought was best does not mean he hasn't answered your prayer because let me tell you something about God. He's always at work. And not only is he at work, some of you, the reason why you've been going through what you're going through is because God is at work in you and around you. How many of you know right now he's working in you? He's working in you and he is working around you. And let me tell you something else. He wants you to know that he has your best interests at heart. He has your best interest at heart. He has your best interest at heart. God is pulling for your success. The Bible says he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. When you begin to prosper and when you begin to excel, God, like a proud parent, gets excited. God has invested a lot in you. Look at your neighbor, don't touch him, just look at him. Tell him I'm here on purpose, tell him I'm here on purpose. 
I'm no accident. I am here on purpose. Now, I've made some bad and silly decisions, and I've done some stuff in the past, but I'm here on purpose. And that's why we need to stop talking about God is a God of a second chance. The devil is a liar. He ain't no God of a second chance. Many of us used up our second chance before Katrina. He's a God not of a second chance, but he's a God of another chance and another chance and another chance. Come on, and another chance. Come on, tell the truth. If God has given you several chances, give him some praise. You know he's a God. He ain't a God of a second chance. He's a God of another chance and another chance and another chance. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Look at your neighbor nod and say, we're going to be all right. We, we're going to be all right because God is at work in us. He's at work around us. He has our best interests at heart. Let me tell you something else. He is infinitely in love with you. And he will stand for nothing less than your very best. And God says, I know you don't understand. He says, but sometimes I'm going to shut doors in your face because I'm not going to allow you to settle for when I've got something greater. Come on, somebody. And every now and then, I know this is not going to be for everybody. But I need a few of us right now. Let's take a moment and thank God for shut doors. See, we always praise him for open doors, but let's thank him for shutting some doors. He will shut some doors. He will shut some doors. He will shut some doors. He says, because I'm in love with you. I'm not going to stand for nothing less than your best. So I want every one of you, I want you to remember this now. Know that you are guarded. Alfred, he, keep, he that keep it Israel, neither slumbers nor sleep. God says, I'm watching out for you 24 seconds, 24 seven. He says, in fact, I've got my angels dispatched all over you. And God said, and, and I'm on duty. So what are you worried about? No evil cannot even get to you because I've got my angels watching over you. Come on, y'all. We forget to praise him for significant stuff. Do you know how many people lose their life in car accidents? You know how many people are killed on highways and interstates? That's why you ought to be more conscious that when you get from point A to point B, when you step on your porch, you ought to say, thank you, Jesus, again, for watching over me and protecting me. Hallelujah. Listen, I want you right now, take a moment and praise God because when you was on the interstate, God made sure the drunk driver was on another highway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He watches over. He protects me. He loves me. He's interested in me. Hallelujah. Help is on the way. I said help is on the way. Now all your neighbor is thinking about is the coronavirus. But you got some stuff that's going on in your life that God says help is on the way. And what the devil meant for evil, God is working it out for your good. By Thanksgiving, by Thanksgiving of this year, you're going to be praising God for two of the biggest miracles you've gotten all your life. I said by Thanksgiving, I said by Thanksgiving, you will be praising God for two of the biggest miracles you've ever received. Shout like you believe it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say it's going to happen this year. 
It's going to happen this year. It's going to happen this year. It's going to happen this year. God says, I'm watching over you always. He says, he says, he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. God watches over you always, but guess what? He's not just watching over you. He's protecting you. Thank God for his protection right now. He, 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 God, God protects you always. Where you get that from, Bishop? We're going to read these verses, then we're gone. Verse number five. Verse five says, the Lord is your keeper. <laughs> the Lord is your shade at your right hand. Why? Because look what he says in verse number six. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Look what verse number seven says. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. What? Y'all acting like y'all Catholic. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Mm -mm. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve you. He shall protect you. It won't touch you. He will preserve you from all evil. And I look at some of y'all sitting back and say, oh, Bishop, that's easy for you to say. But Bishop, what if you get the coronavirus? Well, if I get the coronavirus, he going to heal me. That's what's going to happen. And guess what? I'm going to come back up here and preach and shout because he's a healer. The Lord, the Lord shall preserve you. He shall preserve you from all evil. That's every sickness. That's every disease. That's every virus. That's from depression. That's anxiety. That's poverty. That's physical health. All. Oh! I shall be preserved. Hallelujah. He's going to preserve me. The Lord, God says, I'm watching over you. He says, I am protecting you. Help is on the way. Help is on the way. Remember this now. We're, we're almost done. Remember this, that this was one of the songs that was sung by the pilgrims as they was walking up to Jerusalem. Can you imagine the hot, dry sun that was beating down upon them? And remember now, they was in a desert. So they're walking up toward Jerusalem in the hot, dry sun is beating on them. A rare shade tree. Every now and then, they could find a shade tree that would become a refreshing oasis. But on the other hand, the moon reminds us of the dangers of night. Because understand now, their pilgrimage did not end at night. They still had to walk at night. And while they were walking at night, they had to beware of robbers and wild animals. So that's why as they're singing Psalm 121, day or night, God will keep us from all harm. Oh God, in fact, I'm going to give you a whole nother reason to praise him. You ought to praise him because God says, I'm giving you round-the-clock protection. Round-the-clock protection. I want somebody right now to praise him because he was watching over you while you were sleeping. Come on. Stuff was going on. People, homes was being broken into. Somebody was being held at gunpoint, but he made sure that the angels were standing guard over your house. He shall preserve you. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. He gives us round-the-clock protection. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, he asks a question, if God 
before us. Come on, y'all. We say we believe it, but do you really believe it, Sean? But do, if God be for us, then who can be against us? God is your protector always. He will watch over your life. He is your ultimate security. From COVID-19, he's your ultimate security. From the regular flu virus, he's your ultimate security. From every sickness and illness that is known to man, he is your ultimate security. Your only real security is found in God. Now watch this, because sometimes when we are going through a situation, we suffer from what I call spiritual amnesia. See, you can't forget what God has already done. That's what David did. When David got ready to fight Goliath, the reason why David was able to stand before Goliath was because David got a flashback of what God had already done. David is standing before Goliath and David says, wait a minute. He says, one time I was keeping my father's sheep and a lion came and a bear came. He says, and I destroyed them with my hands. You know why David was rehearsing that? He was feeding his faith to deal with Goliath. That's why when you remember what God has already done, it gives you faith. Come on, y'all, to fight what you are presently dealing with. I'm preaching to myself right now. Sometimes all you need to do is just remember what he's already done. If you done been through Katrina and survived it, give him praise. If you done been through a situation, what? Watch this, watch this, watch this. That's all right, that's okay. Tyler, that's all right. Hold up, hold up. Because we ain't going to deal with this in the next service. The devil, he been trying to take care of He been, I ain't, okay, so we good. I ain't, gonna, I ain't even going to bother with that next service. You can hear me? He don't want me to get this word out. But I'm going to get this word out. In fact, I want, listen, we're going to really make the devil mad and we're going to give him a headache for 10 seconds because I want every one of you in this room. Now, this is going to sound silly to some, but many of you are going to get it. I want those of y'all in the room and those of y'all watching around the world, if you've ever had the flu before, give God praise. Huh. That don't sound like much. Why are you praising God? Because the flu kills some people, but it didn't kill you. And if God has already allowed you to live through a life-threatening situation, give him some praise this morning. Hallelujah. We've already lived through life situations that should have taken some of us out. Do I have a witness here? I, I know I'm talking to some of y'all in this room that you know what God has done for you. When nobody else was there, God was there. So Charles Stanley writes, he says, why worry? The omnipotent Lord of the universe has declared his unending love for you. He says, I'm never going to fail in protecting you. And yet, y'all, we all know that bad things happen to good people. And we all know that death comes for us all unless Jesus comes first. So how can God keep us from all harm? Hold that thought. We're going to come back to that in a second. Lastly, I want you to know that you're not alone. God says, I'm watching over you. He says, I'm protecting you. He says, and guess what? I'm going to be with you always. Wave at me if you know the Lord is always with you. All we've got to do is pick up the second half of verse number 7 and then verse 8 and we'll be done. He says, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Not only will he preserve you from all evil, but he shall preserve your soul. He's going to preserve your whole life. The Lord shall preserve, watch this, your going out 
and your coming in. What are you saying, Bishop? I'm saying this week and the, for the rest of this month until all this is over, if you got to go to the stove, go to the stove. Le cover yourself with the blood of the living lamb and I want you to go to your store and you shop and you take care of your business and you make sure that you take precautions but that you live your best life because if the devil was able to kill you you would be dead by now that's why when you wake up you ought to wake up and open your mouth and say this is the day that the Lord has made I shall rejoice and be glad in it it. no evil shall befall me all the days of my life from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet I am covered God says I will preserve you I'm going to watch over you God says I'm always watching over you he says I'm always watching over you he says, I'm always watching over you. He says, I'm always watching over you. L lift your hands because he's always watching over you. He's always watching over you. Listen, and when the Lord says, Rolanda, when he says, I'm always watching over you, he's not talking about in a negative sense like he's waiting for you to trip up God is not watching over you to say ah I caught you I caught you he's not like that when you eat that extra piece of cake God say ah I caught you I caught you he's not like that when you have all intentions in the world to fast with your church family but you somehow break your fast the Lord says, I'm, I'm watching over you, but I'm not watching over you to try to trip you up. God says, I'm not watching. I heard you. I heard you. God says, you, you, what did you say? You cursed. I heard you. You're supposed to be a Christian. He's not like that. He, aren't you glad that he's not that kind of God where he's just, he ain't just trying to wait for you to mess up? No, God is the most loving non-manipulative parent not one to impose guilt every chance he get when God looks at you he sees he looks at you through the eyes of Jesus thank God for his grace this morning his, his grace is what sustains the Lord says when I called you I knew you had issues the Lord says I don't expect you to be perfect but I do expect you to be mature God says, I'm watching over you with the promise of my presence. He says, coming and going. That phrase, coming and going, refers to the everyday flow of life. Certainly, God was with you in those big moments. God is there. Many of you, he was with you in those big moments. He was with you when you got married. He was with you. He was with you when you went into labor with your first child. He was with you in those big moments. He was with you when you became the employee of the month. He was with you. He was with you when they pulled your application and gave you the job. He was, he was with you when you was going through orientation. He says, I was with you also when you got promoted. But he was also with you when you stood there at the altar looking at a loved one that you wasn't through loving. God says, I was with you. The Lord says, I was with you when you moved from the country. When you moved to the big city. I was with you when you relocated. I was with you. God says, so yeah, I've always been with you in those big moments. He's, oh God, Jesus, lift your hands, please. I'm about to cry again, please. He says, I'm always with you. In those big significant moments. He says, but I'm also with you when no one else is around. 
he says, he says, I was with you. And I'm with you when you wake up in the morning. He says, I'm with you when you decide that you're going to have just one slice of toast. He says, and when you're standing there over the toaster, I'm with you. He says, I'm with you when you decide to take a walk around your neighborhood when you go out for your walk. He says, when you're ordering your movie off of Netflix, I'm with you. He says, when you're typing, when you're responding to an email, he says, I'm with you. When you're on your way to go meet someone for lunch, he says, I'm with you. When you go to bed at night, he says, I'm with you. In those lonely, depressing, fearful moments, he says, I'm with you. And if you are a believer, everywhere you go, Holy Spirit goes with you. That's why you have nothing, Jesus, you have nothing to fear. This was a big promise Jesus made to his disciples in John 16 and 7. He says, for verily or truly I say to you, it is good that I go away. Because unless I go, Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he's with you. Thank you, Lord God. Not just in the big moments. He's with you. When you wake up in the middle of the night and your mind is everywhere, he says, I'm with you. When you're laying there in the bed and you're sleeping, but you can't go to sleep, he says, I'm with you. We're going to space out a couple of y'all. Come on to the altar real quickly. I don't know who this is ministering.